need to do this. I'm sorry. We ready? Yeah, I am. We good? Hey, we want to greet you. We're already having fun, and uh, we just want to say hello to Grace and Truth Ministries in South Dakota. We love you, and we want to greet everybody watching live stream. Uh, we're honored that you can join us and be with us, and uh, we love you. Everybody say, we love you. Love you. Amen. Deuteronomy 8.18, and I just want to share this real quickly before we jump into our message. Um, it says, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Now, it's really important to understand something. God is concerned with your finances. Okay? Never, never, never lose sight of the fact that God is concerned with your finances. How many of y'all are concerned with your finances? How many of y'all take some money to live and, and move on this planet? Amen? Now, when we get to heaven, <clears throat> it's not going to take money. But while we're down here on this earth, it takes money. And so, um, it's really important for you to understand. How many know our God is a healer? Can I get an amen? How many know our God is a Savior in the sense that He saves us from our sins and causes us to be born again? How many know that our God is a protector? Now, you also have to understand this. Your God is a provider. Don't lose that in the midst of, uh, of, of the different things that God's doing. I know that the message of quote-unquote prosperity has been greatly abused. I know that you know, we even talked about that a little bit earlier where people, uh, you know, hallelujah. How many know people try to abuse anything that's powerful? I love my son. Because I love my son, I want to take care of his needs. Does that make sense? Do you think that our Father in Heaven loves us? Do you think He wants to take care of your needs? Amen. He certainly does. And in this passage of Scripture, it says that He gives us power to get wealth that He may establish the covenant. Now here's the thing. How many you know it's, it can be a challenge to be a blessing to somebody else when you're always scared that your needs are not going to be met? Do you know lack makes you very self-conscious? Because if you're in fear and you're in lack and you're scared that your needs are not going to be met, are you, is it going to be as easy for you to reach out and meet someone else's needs? It's not, is it? And so this is what God wants to do. God wants to bless you personally, financially, so that you can be a blessing to other people personally and financially. Can you get an amen? Receive that. Receive that. Receive that. God wants to give into your bosom so that you can, number one, because He loves you and He can take care of you. But number two, so you can be a blessing into other people's lives. Amen? It's a beautiful thing. You know, when I went to Starbucks this morning, and we had a bunch of flowers in my house from uh, various Mother's Day stuff, you know, and I grabbed some before I left, and when I got there, my plan was I was going to give flowers to the mamas that was working there that day. Amen? And uh, how many know that people need to be honored? Amen. People need to be blessed. Who are people going to be honored and blessed through? Us. Amen? Now, as I, as I handed out those flowers, how many know it was a tremendous surprise and it was a tremendous blessing to them? Amen? But here's the thing. I couldn't have handed the flowers out if I didn't have any. But because I had some, I had an opportunity to hand some out. You can only give what you have first received. You can only give what you have first received. You can only give what you have first received. And so, understanding this, God wants to bless you. Yeah, receive it. God, God wants to. Now, now God wants to. Now, he, you're already blessed with all heavenly blessings and spiritually places in, in Christ Jesus. But God wants to supply your needs so that you cannot be self-consumed and self-focused so that you can reach out and help other people. Can I get an amen? amen? It's one of the joys of being a Christian is helping other people. Amen? So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. If you need to give an out this morning, we'll get one to you. Just lift your hand up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's important to understand that. You know? How many of you there are some people that believe that God is a healer and there are some people that do not? Amen? And... Um, he is a healer, but not everybody knows him as a healer. Well, 
he is a provider, but not everybody knows him as a provider. And um, it's important to know him like that. Hallelujah. All right, John 19. Let's go ahead and get started in what God's got for us this morning. You know, because we'd spent so much time talking in the introduction and stuff, I kind of wanted to skip that, but I felt like God didn't want to. He wants you to know that He loves you and He wants to supply your needs. Amen? How I many know sometimes you've got to let God do some things? You've got to let Him bless you. Amen? Now listen, He's not blessing you. Well, I'm not. He's blessing you because He loves you. Amen? Father, we thank You and praise You for the opportunity to give and to sow into this ministry. Lord, we, just, uh, we thank You for it. We thank You that the gospel continues to flourish and to go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, John 19, and, you know, we have, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about, um, let me just pray real quick. Father, I just thank You that You teach through me this morning and that You just let the teacher take over and You convey to Your people and let revelation be caught this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, we t- talked about a couple weeks ago before Jake Stringer came how there are times when you open the Bible and it looks like there's a contradiction. You see it say one thing on this place and you see it say something else over here and it can potentially look like there's a contradiction in the Word of God. Now, and I always say this, there will be a contradiction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Amen? I mean, there is supposed to be a contradiction because they're two different covenants. You know, if, if, if your cell phone company comes to you and says, we have a new contract for you, and that contract looks exactly like your old contract, how many you know they do not have a new contract for you? It's the exact same one. And so with, with our God, your Bible... Is, um, is broken up into, into the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, there is a contradiction between the two. One is based on Jesus and the work of grace and God's finished work, and the other is man trying to accomplish what he could not. Amen? We don't throw away the Old Covenant. We let Jesus and the Holy Spirit take us by the hand. We go back into the Old Covenant, and we see Jesus revealed. Amen? Now, so... There is a definite contradiction between the Old and New Covenant, but then, how I many know oh, there are times when you can open the Bible... And you can look, and there can appear to be a contradiction. Now, here's the thing. God is not schizophrenic. God is not crazy. And God does not speak out of both sides of his mouth. God's not saying one thing here and another thing here. Would y'all want to serve a God like that? I wouldn't. I mean, it's a challenge to be around a person that you can't trust let alone a God that you can't trust that you've never physically seen. And so what happens is there are times when it looks like there's a contradiction, but in reality, there's not a contradiction that's taking place. We need to take a look closer and let the Holy Spirit reveal to us what's being said. Can I get an amen? Now, let's look at it in uh, John 19. This is probably one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. Um, This is Jesus on the cross, and he makes this statement that is, I mean, I feel like it's been echoing for 2,000 years when he said this. John 19, verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, this is right at the end of his crucifixion, he said, it is finished, and up his spirit. Now, how many of you know that Jesus has accomplished it all? Can I get an Amen. Jesus did what no man could do. Jesus' blood cleansed what no blood of bulls and goats could cleanse. Jesus accomplished what no one else can do. And when he said that it is finished, how many know it was and is and always will be? Jesus has completed the work. When he said it was finished on the cross, how many know that he fulfilled the law? He fulfilled the Old Covenant. He was born of a virgin. He was born without sin. He could step to the law and say, I kept this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. I have kept it. I have fulfilled it. I have opened the door. Now I will be the sacrifice for everyone who could not. How many of the law came to make us all guilty? 
The entire world stood guilty and condemned before God's standard of morality. No man could keep it. Only God could fulfill his law. So God came. God fulfilled the law. He, then he became the sacrifice. And then the Bible says, how many know that he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly? On the cross, Jesus kicked the devil's butt. Amen? He shut him down. How many know game's over? The devil's game is over. Is the devil defeated? He is defeated. He's been defeated for over 2,000 years. Okay? Has, has all of the sin of mankind been paid for? Absolutely. Your sin was paid for before you were born. Take it an amen. Your sin was paid for before you were born. You received that cancellation when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and you were born again. But your sin has already been paid for. How many know everyone's sin's already been paid for? Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And so, it is finished, is a reality. And how many know this is one of the things right now that God is restoring to the body of Christ? Because you've got a lot of Christians trying to labor to accomplish what's already been accomplished on the cross. You've got a lot of Christians trying to fight in warfare for things that Jesus has already done. Are y'all tracking me here? And, um, and so there is this reality that it is finished. It's one of the things that God's revealing right now. He's opening the eyes of the body of Christ. He's awaking us to the fact that Jesus did a good job. Amen. How many know Jesus did a good job? We're just trying to convince preachers that Jesus did a good job. And we're trying to convince uh, God's children that Jesus did a good job. This morning as I stand before you, you're forgiven. You are just as forgiven as the day that you were born again. You are just as clean and just without spot. But Jeremiah, but Jeremiah, but Jeremiah, but Jeremiah. Remember, it is finished. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Hey, it's done, man. You're born again. Game over. Where are you, where are you going? Heaven. Good news, right? Amen. And it was free for you and me, but it cost heaven everything. Amen. And so that is a reality. And yet, let's look at a different scripture. <laughs> let's go to um, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We are to rest in that finished work. We are to enjoy that finished work. We are to uh, guard the reality of the complete and total victory of the cross. Jesus has done it all. Amen? Got many songs that sing that. But in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and in verse 12, it says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to that which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. If it's finished, then why do we got to fight? Does there, there appears to be a contradiction right here. If it is finished, then why is there still a battle? <laughs> Amen? You know, if you're, you know, I, I coach basketball, and if we are playing a game of basketball with the kids, and all of a sudden the buzzer hits, the game is over, our team won, and then how many know game's over? We don't have to score any more baskets because we've already won. But have you ever, as a child, ran a race with somebody? You're out running a race and you beat them? And they were like, no, you didn't. You didn't win. I won. Now, if you are confident in the fact that you won, they're not going to rile you up. But if you are not confident in the fact that you won, they tell everybody, no, he didn't win, I won. No, I won. No, I won. And then you see someone looking, and you got two people trying to declare they won, and you don't really know who won. But if you know you won, you don't have to argue with someone who's saying you didn't. Are y'all tracking me here? Amen? Or, let's say it like this. You ever played this game before? What if I came up to Beth, and I took her nose? <laughs> I got your nose! <laughs> I got your nose. As an adult, she's not going to freak out. 
<laughs> yeah, let's hope not. But two years ago, so when my son was four or five, and I came up and said, I got your nose, he would get really upset. No, you don't. My nose is right here. I got your nose. No, you don't. Daddy, you don't have my nose. <clears throat> and yeah, you ever, as children, you can really, really bother a child with that because they think that, you know, you've got their nose. Now, he knows he doesn't, he knows I don't have his nose. <laughs> but because of the fact, I mean, you know, I can talk him into the point where he can get really upset and really out, been out of whack. You ever had anybody do that as a child? Get you all upset, even though you know what they're saying is not true. Are y'all tracking me here this morning? Just giving a couple basic examples here. And so we see that it is finished, and then we say that we are to fight the good fight of faith. So what is it? Is it finished, or are we supposed to fight? Contradiction. Let's look at more Scripture. Um, Ephesians chapter 6. And this is one of the primary portions of Scripture that talks about warfare in the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 6. Because how many know that we have an enemy? Right? You have an enemy, and that enemy is going to try to stand against you. He's going, how many know the devil hates God's children? Hates them. See, he cannot mess with God. God has already beaten him. And so what he tries to do is he tries to mess with what God loves to get back at God. How many know if you have children, you love your children? And you'd rather someone come after you than come after your children. Hands down. Easily said on Mother's Day, right? And so the enemy has already lost, but now he's trying to come against God's children to try to get back at God the defeat that was delivered to him through the cross. And so it is finished, but then we are, we are, we are encouraged to fight the good fight of faith. And so let's take a look at it. Ephesians chapter 6, and in verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, I'm going to read through this and I'm going to go back and teach. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which we may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, and then it, it goes on, but I just want to read that to you because how many of you know this sounds like war? This sounds like a battle, right? And so let's go back and teach in verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. How many of you know as Christians, we are called to be strong in His strength, not our own? And many times, that's one of the places where Christians fail is because they're trying to do something in their willpower instead of God's power. Now, your willpower can choose to do the right thing, but your willpower is going to connect you to God's grace, which is going to empower you to want to do the right thing. How many of y'all, you had some challenges coming to church today? Sure. You know why? The devil hates you. <laughs> right? And... The gospel, the preaching of God's word, Jesus Christ is life. And you need daily bread. How I many know oh, you need a daily dose of Jesus? You need regular Jesus. Amen? And as you are hearing it, it's strengthening you, but it took a decision of your will to come here. Can I get an amen? But that will, that decision of the will is a spark to enter you into his strength. How I many know oh, a car is not to run on the power of the battery? For those of you that may know some things about that, uh, your battery can't run your car. <coughs> but your battery can be the spark that kicks on your alternator, which allows the gas-powered motor to keep everything running the electricity charged. 
Your will is not what your Christianity is supposed to be ran on. And that's one of the things that's so dangerous about legalism is it places people in the strength of their, their own strength and they try to walk in love. <coughs> or they try to serve God in their own strength because what legalism does is it frustrates grace and removes his strength and tries to replace it with ours so that when we get something, we can boast in us. When we are blessed, we can boast in us. How many know there is no room for anyone to boast in anything except Jesus? There's nobody in this room any better than anybody else. There's no one in this room more spiritual. There's no one in this room closer to God. No, ladies and gentlemen, our boast is in Jesus Christ and the cross, and that's it. Amen. And so, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand. Everybody say that. You may be able to do what? Stand. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now that word wiles means scheming deceit. How many of the devil has plans, listen to me, to get you to believe a lie? When you believe a lie, it, that lie becomes your reality. And when you believe a lie, that lie now has power over you. Are y'all tracking me here? Like, for example, someone stands up from the pulpit and makes the statement, if you don't tithe, you're cursed. Now, that was true in the Old Covenant. That's not true in the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, who took the curse? Jesus. It doesn't say Jesus just took the curse for tithers. It says Jesus took the curse for those that believe. So if someone stands up and says, if you don't tithe, you're cursed, how many know as you believe that lie, it can try to bring curse into your life? Because you are believing it, you're expecting punishment, you get a flat tire, you think, man, that's because I didn't tithe. Or get a doctor bill, man, that's because I didn't tithe. Man, that's because of this, man, that's because of that. And all of a sudden, your, your salvation becomes facilitated in your own hands instead of the work of the cross. Everybody tracking me here this morning? So, uh, is it good to support God's vision and God's kingdom? Absolutely. But your giving does not take the, take the curse away. Jesus Christ took the curse away. Amen. So, someone believes that lie, it's going to bring the reality of that lie in their life. Or someone stands up and says, God's mad at you. I mean, I've ever heard that. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. God's mad at you. You know, God's not pleased with you. You know, you're, you know, you're, you're just barely saved. Well, how I many you know, as people believe that, does it cause them to want to draw near to God? It causes them to run from God or place a mask on their face so tight they can somehow impress God and impress the pastor that they're a good person. Okay? The reality is this morning God is not mad at you. God is madly in love with you and you are forgiven and innocent and you've been made the righteousness of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, if you believe the lie that God is angry with you and you're condemned, how many know that that lie is going to become your reality? Even though God's not mad at you. You ever had a close friend and someone uh, got in between you and that friend and said, hey, they're really mad at you. Yep, they're mad at you. I heard them talking about you the other day. Well, how many know if you believe those lies, it's going to mess with your friendship? Even though your friend has not been mad or never been mad the whole time. But as you believe that lie, that lie becomes your reality. My point being, the devil is always trying to lie to you. And specifically, trying to lie to you about the way God feels about you. And I'll even go further to say about the way the pastor feels about you. Yep. Do not think that the enemy won't try to attack our relationship. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, he tries to separate you from the person that serves you bread. Right. Just the truth. I saw the way he looked at me. I saw what he said. I saw this. I saw that. I saw that. Folks, <laughs> I'm a simple man. <laughs> and I ain't mad at nobody. But I know how the enemy thinks. And I know he tries to separate. Um... And so he's always bringing forth schemes. So it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemes, the deceit, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, let's stop here for a second. Are people your enemy? Are people ever your enemy? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Does the devil use people? Does the devil use Christians? Just because the devil is using Christians, does that make those Christians your enemy? No. Do we wrestle against those Christians? No. Do we want to? No. <laughs> Appreciate that honesty. <laughs> but it says we do not <clears throat> wrestle against flesh and blood, but 
Now hold on here. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers and rules of darkness in this age. Now check it out. We don't wrestle against people, but we do wrestle with the enemy. Principalities and powers. <clears throat> so it's not saying that you are not wrestling. It's saying that you don't wrestle with people. So wait a minute. If it is finished, then why do I got to wrestle the devil? If it is finished, then why do I have to fight the good fight of faith? <coughs> Selah. <laughs> against the powers, against the rules of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. Everybody say withstand. In the evil day and having done all to stand. You seen how many times stand is mentioned here? Verse 14. Stand, therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, so we see here that there is a battle and that there is a wrestling that takes place. Now, here's the thing. Is the devil defeated? Yes, sir, please. Is the devil defeated? Is there any salvation for the devil? Not at all. Thank you so much. Um... The devil is defeated. There's no salvation for him. His game is over. But how many know he does not play by the rules? And how many know he is not honorable and he cheats? He is a spiritual outlaw and he does not play by the rules. And so he knows that he's lost, but he's trying to lie to God's children to say, I did not lose. The cross was not enough. And there's more that you need to do to accomplish what Jesus has already done. Yep. Yep. He is a liar. Anybody ever played King of the Mountain? Yep. Let's talk about it. Anybody ever not played King of the Mountain? Okay. Amen. The New Yorkers and the young people. I said amen. It's all good. <laughs> amen. Because you ain't got no mountains in New York, right? No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> King of the Mountain... Um, is where you climb to the top, and once you're on top, you are the king of the mountain. Now, what everyone else is trying to do is they're trying to drag you off of the top so that they can be king of the mountain. It's a fun, heavily, um, f very physical game that, that kids play, and hopefully adults don't, right? <laughs> It'd be weird if we were out there playing king of the mountain. Hallelujah. Or fun. Hallelujah. Um, but my point being, and this is the analogy that the Lord gave me, in the mountain, you are already in a place of victory. You have already won, but you're, the people are trying to drag you out of the winner's circle. They're trying to drag you out of your place of victory. Are y'all tracking me here this morning? Now here's the thing. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are permanently set in the, pl in the place of victory. How many of the Bible says we have been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? The being of the Ephesians said we have already been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Jesus finished it. Jesus blessed you. You receive him as Lord and Savior. And now you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are already in a place of victory. You have already won. Can I get an amen? But the devil is trying to scheme and convince you that you have not won and that you somehow need to do something to get yourself in the winner's circle. My point being, the wrestling is to try to pull you out of the place of victory. The fight is a fight of faith. What does he try to do? He tries to bring in doubt concerning your healing. Let's talk about it for a second. The Bible says that... Um, by His stripes we were healed. How many know that as a born-again child of God, you have already been healed and made whole in Jesus Christ? You are not trying to get healed. You have already been healed. But Jeremiah, what about these symptoms that are on my body? What about the, those symptoms that are on your body are lies from the devil, and they are contrary to the Word of God. We walk by faith, not by... How many know we walk by what we believe, not what we feel? 
And so the enemy tries to come to a child of God and put a very real sickness on their body and it, where you can see it, you can taste it, you can touch it, you can hear it, you can feel it. But those facts of attack are not greater than the reality of Jesus' stripes. And so as a child of God, you are to guard your place of victory, and you are to declare what God has said about you, not what the doctor has said about you, and not what anyone else has said about you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the fight of faith. <clears throat> you guard your place of victory. No, I don't receive this. By Jesus' stripes I was healed. My God is a healer. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. Jesus doesn't have cancer. I don't have cancer. Jesus doesn't have diabetes. I don't have diabetes. Are y'all tracking me here? We do not want to let go. Wow, this chair is getting a little... Amen. <laughs> I better step on the outside. Hallelujah. 220 pounds right here might not be good. It might turn into an America's Funniest Home video rather than a sermon. You know what I'm saying? Which might be all right. Hallelujah. But the enemy tries to drag us out of that reality of what Jesus has accomplished for us. Can I get an Amen. Now, in, in making this statement, I'm not saying we don't go to doctors. I'm not saying we don't take medication. I'm not saying we, we don't do those things. How I many of you have to be led by what God has told you to do? You do not live according to someone else's life experience. You do not live according to someone else's faith. You be led by what God has told you to do. Doctors are not the enemy. They don't come from the devil. I've heard people preach that, that the entire medical community is from the devil. Uh, I don't think so. People that help people are not from the devil. And some of y'all, this may sound completely alien to you, but others of you, it may be a breath of fresh air. If God leads you to do that, but how many know God may not lead you to do that? Bottom line, it's what God leads you to do. Can you get an amen? Amen. And so, the reality is, by His stripes, we were healed. And then here's the other reality. How many know God says He supplies all of our needs according to His riches and glory? He became poor, that through His poverty we might be Amen. Have an abundance, right? And so when the enemy is trying to bring lack into your life, you're not supposed to climb down off your chair and try to fight the devil. No, you wrestle the doubt, stay in the place of victory, and declare, my God supplies my needs. Can I get an amen? And you enter into the rest of the fact, God supplies my needs, God takes care of me, God is the one that is my provider. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. Now, are you seeing that this is a fight? Can I get an amen? It is a fight of faith. Now, I'm not trying to accomplish what Jesus accomplished on the cross. I'm just trying to believe it. <laughs> are, you, are you tracking me here? And so the enemy is going to try to bring in lies and try to bring in doubt to cause me to not believe it. Now, let's take a look at the way two different people handled fighting the devil. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, our champion, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how he fought the devil. And let's take a look at our ancestor, the most popular man when we get to heaven, Adam. <laughs> Everybody want to come hang out with Adam. <laughs> Why did you eat the fruit? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, he's got special security up there, man. You know, he's... Where's Adam at? Oh, he's on the back 40, man. He's, in the... he's protected, you know, because... Just kidding. <laughs> Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Amen. God knew that the beauty of redemption would be greater than the beauty of creation. Um, and so... Adam. Now, let me ask you a question. When God made Adam, Adam was already in the place of victory. Now, the devil came to him and talked him out of his victory. The devil came to him and said, If you eat this fruit, you will be like God. Was Adam already like God? Was Adam created in God's image? He was. God was his father. He was already like God. But he left his place of rest. He left his place of victory. 
And he went down to try to accomplish something that had already been given to him as a gift. He did not need to eat that fruit to be like God. He was already like God. And eating that fruit, he awakened his conscience to know good and evil, and his conscience became awake and had the ability to condemn him for wrong. The knowledge of good and evil. Ladies and gentlemen, most of our battles are with our conscience. Most of Christianity, they develop, a, they develop and foster a sin consciousness to try to keep people in line. The only challenge is freedom from sin does not come from condemnation. Freedom from sin comes from grace. And the fact that God loves us and we've been made clean and innocent. Amen? Not saying the conscience is a bad thing. How I many you know a good conscience is good? An evil conscience is bad. An evil conscience is a conscience that's continually aware of of sin and shortcoming. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? When you feel dirty, you act dirty. When you feel condemned and feel like you're a sinner, you're going to act like one. But when you feel clean, you're going to act clean. When you believe right, you're going to act right. And that's why the gospel comes in and reminds you the cross was enough. God loves you. Your sin has been paid for. I said paid for. Paid for. Paid for. Your sin's been paid for. The very root of the, word, of the concept of the word shalom is that it's paid for. How many know when it's paid for, there's peace? When there is a debt, there's not peace. There has been a sin debt that has been paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ and through the work of the cross. Now there is peace. You got peace with God. Emmanuel, God with you. Good news. Amen? And so, Adam, made like God, created in the image of God, the enemy schemed a lie, attacked him, and this is kind of what the devil did to him. He said, I got your nose. I got your nose, Adam. I want my nose. Well, come on. I'll show you how to get it back. And I know that's slightly juvenile. But how many know that the devil had nothing on Adam? And the devil had nothing that Adam needed. And yet... Adam chose to believe the words of the devil over the words of God, and he took and he tried to do something to become what he already was. Are y'all tracking me here? You see how sneaky the devil is? He just didn't come up and say, he didn't come up and just say, uh, did you see that fruit? Or he didn't just come up and say, he did, he did it in a very subtle way. How many of the devil subtle? He said, if you eat that fruit, you'll be like God. And amazingly enough, he attacked his wife. He attacked his wife. The Bible says Adam was not deceived. And you know, the reason probably the wife was able to be deceived, this is all conjecture. <laughs> it's not lined out in Scripture. But Adam did not, I don't think Adam communicated correctly to his wife about the fruit. Because when he told her, he said, she said, well, lest we touch it, we die. How I many know oh, God never said that? So as she touched it, she didn't die. And so she said, hey, I've touched it. Let's go ahead and eat it. So really, it's Adam's fault because he didn't communicate. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Sorry, Sorry Steve. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Not true. Not true. The challenge is, is the woman didn't cook, and that's why the fall took place. <laughs> I am. I'm on a roll, aren't I? Amen. It's all them cupcakes I ate last night. I'm feeling a little... A little sugary up here, you know? They're really good. Swallow. All right. Let's look at Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. And how many know Jesus, the second Adam, came to fix what the first Adam messed up? And so, how many know Adam failed the warfare test? Adam failed staying in his place of victory. How many know all Adam had to do was just stand? He didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to fight the devil. He just had to stand. And so let's see how Jesus handles this. Verse, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered him and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, check this out. He says to him, If you are the Son of God, 
command that these stones become bread. Now, he comes to challenge who Jesus is. He's going to try to get Jesus to prove that he's the Son of God. Now, let me ask you a question. Could Jesus have taken the stones and turned them into bread? Absolutely. But here's the thing. Jesus is not going to come down out of his place of victory to perform for the devil. Jesus knows he's the Son of God. He don't have to prove it to anybody. And so what the devil tries to do, he tries to get Jesus to do something to prove who he is. Are y'all tracking me here? And notice the devil's tried to come up and tried to get, tried to provoke him. But Jesus does not perform for the devil. You know what he does? He stands in his place of victory knowing he's the son of God and he does not need to do anything to prove it to anyone. Ladies and gentlemen, true confidence is displayed in the place of rest. You ever get around someone and they're not confident in who they are? And they're always trying to prove to everyone that they're awesome? You ever been around a teenager before? (laughs) I uh, ran a youth center in Frankfurt for a long time, and God love them. The, the, you know, when, when kids are that age, there's a lot of proving going on because they're not real sure who they are, and so there's a lot of time spent trying to prove something, you know. And the guys would come down with their little cut off shirt, cut, their little uh, cut off shirts, you know, and they got their they got their their little their little thin arms out, you know, and they're over there by the water fountain, you know, they're like, mm, let me let me get that for you, you know, and. They're trying to prove to the other gender that they are a man. Amen. And how many know that if you are a man, you don't have to prove it? The difference between the boldness of a chihuahua and the boldness of a lion. How many know a chihuahua always has something to prove? How many know a lion doesn't? If you will notice the lion, he's usually laying down. You ever look at a lion? I mean, them brothers are out in the Sahara just like. You know why? They know they're the king of the jungle. They know they don't have any predators outside of man. And they ain't trying to prove anything to anybody. You go to the zoo, you want to see them roar. Do they roar? No, they snore. (laughs) Because the lion is confident that he's a lion. Are you tracking me? Faith is displayed in the place of rest. Faith is not displayed in the place of turmoil and trying to prove something. Are y'all tracking me here? And so we see Jesus, and he says, this is what he says. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge of you. So now... The devil couldn't get him on the first one, so the next one, the devil pulls out some scripture. Do you know the devil knows the Bible? And so he pulls out some scripture to try to get Jesus to prove that he's the Son of God. Y'all tracking me here? And, And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Did Jesus do what the devil told him to do? No. Again, the devil took him up an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things will I give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Now, how many of Then the devil left, and the angels ministered to him. This is how we are to conduct the fight of faith. Was there ever a moment when Jesus was going to suddenly not be the Son of God? How many know Jesus was the Son of God and there was nothing the enemy could do to make him not be the Son of God? Jesus already, how many know that was finished? Jesus knew it was finished, and so Jesus was not going to try to get what he already had 
or prove to, to the devil what he already knew. So he did not wrestle physically. He did not wrestle with action, but he did do one thing. He spoke. Back to Ephesians. He spoke. He stood his ground, and he spoke. And as I'm saying this, understand, this is everyday life. Okay? While you're on this planet, you got an enemy, and you need to know how to resist him in the faith. Now, what you don't want to do is get over in all this crazy spiritual warfare trying to accomplish something the cross has already accomplished. How many of y'all have ever been in that? I have too. It's a long ride, boy. The devil will allow you to get out of your place of victory and try to fight him hand to hand until you wear yourself out. The devil loves to cajole you into fighting him. See, you don't fight him from a place of equality. You fight him from a place of superiority. Do you know that you have authority over the devil? One whisper from your lips is greater than a thousand demons. It's what the Bible says. You don't have to fear the devil. You have more challenges with people than you will the devil. Because you don't got to wrestle, you don't wrestle with the people, but when someone you love gets something on them and they're operating carnally, I mean, oh, that's not fun. But at the same time, the battle's still the same. You resist the same way. Now, Ephesians chapter 5, and is it 5? 6, thank you. Ephesians chapter 6, <clears throat> let's look at it, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Pull on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand. Already got the victory. You're standing in your place of victory. Against the schemes of deceit of the devil, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Withstand. That's the word histomai in the Greek, and it means to withstand against. Same thing as you standing up here in your place of victory and someone trying to pull you off your place of victory. You withstand them. I am healed. I am healthy. I am provided for. I am saved. I am forgiven. May not look like it, may not feel like it, but I'm going to agree with what God has said, not what the enemy's trying to bring against me. Can I get an amen this morning? And so, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Now, how many know that truth is the opposite of lies, and truth prevents lies from having power over you? How many know this book is truth? Amen. Amen. Never let anyone devalue the word of God in your eyes. The Word is truth. And sometimes I think people can lose respect for it because people have wrongly divided the Word and preached it from a con condemnation standpoint. Don't let people steal the Word of God from you. God gave us this. Amen? Certainly we've got to rightly divide it. Certainly we've got to determine when it's talking to us or when it's talking to someone in the Old Covenant. But ladies and gentlemen, this Word right here, it is an, it's a love letter from God. Don't let anyone take the respect for the Word of God from you just because people have abused it. Don't let them steal it from you. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet... Sh well, we could teach forever on just those couple things right there. How many know the breastplate of righteousness protects your heart from condemnation? Amen. Having your, and having your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How many know when you know you have peace with God, you walk in peace, and you can extend peace? Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now listen to me. Now, there is only one thing that was mentioned that was an offensive weapon. Everything else was defensive. How did Jesus stay standing? He said what God said. Can you get an Amen. He said what God said. Now here's the thing. The Bible says, The Spirit of faith speaketh. Right? How'd you get saved? 
Did you climb a ladder or jump through a hoop? No, you didn't. You, you believed something in your heart and you spoke it, right? So the spirit of faith speaks when you are up here and the enemy's trying to come against you and trying to bring sickness against your body, lack into your home, strife in your marriage, rebellion in your children. When the enemy tries to come against uh, uh, your righteousness because you've made a mistake, you must say what God has said. Now listen, listen, get this. You saying it does not make it happen. Got to go there. Because I know for some of y'all, you can get a little bit of a gag reflex because of where some of this... T and I see you out there gagging, but just bear with me, all right? It's the Word of God, and it's true. We just got to bathe it in grace and see it in truth. Gagging in church. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> me saying it does not make it happen. Me saying it is acknowledging that it has already happened. Are y'all tracking me here? Because remember, the fight is the fight of what? When I am saying it, me saying it is helping me to believe it and overcome the doubt. Because the battle is against the lies of the enemy. You know, when, when you make a huge mistake and you act a fool, or you get mad or run your mouth or whatever, <laughs> the enemy's going to come in and try to make you feel like God does not love you. Or you have bad circumstances take place in your life. And the enemy's like, see, if God loved you, this wouldn't be happening. Does God love you? Yes, yes he does. Did he prove his love to you and that he sent his son to die for you? Yes. If you want to see <clears throat> the proving of God's love, look at the cross. Don't look at your experiences. Yes. Because we live in a crazy world. So when the enemy comes in and tries to say God does not love you, you must say what God has said. Now, as you say it, does it make God love you more? As you say it, does it allow you to enjoy the love that's already there? And see, the error of confession is saying that I'm going to speak something and make it happen. It's quite a bit like New Age. No, no, no. I say what God has said. I stand in my place of victory. And when the devil tries to come against me and attack a relationship, I say, no, I'm in covenant with that person. doesn't matter how I feel. I love them, they love me. My children shall all be taught of the Lord. My whole house shall be saved. How many of you know that's what God has said? Are these the promises of God? They are. Now here's the thing. Jesus already did it and gave it to you as a gift for free. Everybody say for free. But here's the thing. The enemy through his lies, is trying to drag you out of your place of victory, get you down on the ground, trying to do something to become something you already are. Are y'all tracking me here? Here's the thing. Evidence of faith is rest. Hebrews chapter 3. And we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll close right here. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3. It says, We who have believed do enter that rest. When you are believing something, you are at rest. The evidence of faith is rest. For example, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing that anyone can tell me to convince me that I am not going to heaven. Now, there was a time in my life <clears throat> when I wasn't as sure as I am now. But now I know heaven is a gift. Heaven has nothing to do with my ability. Heaven is not a ladder you climb. Heaven is a gift that you receive. <clears throat> who, who, who got heaven for us? Jesus. Amen? I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to heaven. So now... Someone may try to, you know how you go to these different functions and stuff, and you got people out there on mics telling everybody they're going to hell. <clears throat> Those people get up and say, well, you know, you're wearing blue jeans, so you're going to hell. And you're wearing makeup, so you're going to hell. And you're doing this because you're going to hell. And your shorts are too short, and blah, 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 and your hair is too long, and all that kind of stuff, right? They can say that all day long. That's not what the book says. The book says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So they can run their mouth all day long. I'm going to walk through with rest. 
Because Jeremiah Johnson is going to heaven with his long hair and his trousers and his Chuck Taylors. Amen? And it has nothing to do with what I wear. It has everything to do with what Jesus wore for me. Can I get an amen? And you've got to be adamant about that. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> they can run their mouth all day long. I'm not going to take my rest away. I know in whom I have believed. Are you tracking me? So how do we know that there's faith there? There's rest. I got rest. No one can convince me that the work of the cross was not enough. Now, I have rest in that area. But you know there are other areas that I might not have as much rest in? Family salvation, that my whole house will be saved. Financial supply, health, of, health of, of, of the bodies of those in my family, divine protection, all those things. When I am believing that, I have rest. Are y'all tracking me here? I have rest when I'm believing that. You know, if I come up to Beth, like I said earlier, and I take her nose, she's not freaking out that I took her nose. She knows she got her nose. But if I could somehow bring enough doubt into her heart that I really had her nose, freak out and try to get her nose back. <clears throat> now, as she's freaking out and trying to get her nose back, she's proving that she does not believe that she has her nose. Have y'all ever done that in the area of healing before? Have y'all ever done that in the area of your children or your families? Ladies and gentlemen, when you believe, you're at rest. You know why? Because you are trusting God. You are not trusting yourself and your actions and your obedience. Do you know God does not bless you on your obedience? God blesses you on Jesus' obedience. Can I get an amen? Is it called unmerited favor? Yeah. It's for free. See, you are not free to believe until you know that you do not have to earn. The moment you think you have to earn healing or earn salvation or earn financial provision or earn protection or earn that your children are going to be okay, the moment you think you've got to earn it, you leave your place of victory and you get down on the ground and you walk around like a worm trying to get something that God has already given you. And the devil has, has baited you into fighting him on his level and he loves you to fight him. Because the more attention you spend on him, the less attention you spend on Jesus. The more attention you are putting out small fires rather than just sitting at his feet, hearing his word, and trusting that he's going to take care of you because he loves you. And that's why our faith is energized by love. When you believe God loves you, it is easy to believe He's going to do what He said He's going to do. But when you don't believe that God loves you because of mistakes that you have made or sin that you've gotten into, it's hard to believe that He's going to do what He said that He was going to do. Are you tracking me here? And that's why it's so important to understand the complete forgiveness of sin because if you feel like God's mad at you because of sin that you've done and somehow the cross was not enough, you will not feel like God loves you and your faith will not be energized. Your faith will be small and you'll be operating in fear and you will be left to save yourself. You will be left to heal yourself. You will be left to provide for yourself. You will be left to be your own God. You are not called to be your God. You are not called to be your Savior. He saves you because He loves you. He delivers you because He loves you. Can I get an amen this morning? And a part of what the, it's reminding people, hey, wait a minute, this is not about us, this is about Jesus. Amen. And so, when we are, how many know if you, anybody got, got someone in their life you know you can trust? How many know that when you ask them to do something, you got peace? Because you know you can trust that person. And when we know that God loves us, we're at rest. And we're at peace because we believe that He's going to do what He said He's going to do. Now, will it happen in your timetable? I would virtually guarantee you that it will not. <laughs> I would encourage you not to put God on a timetable. Don't do it, man. You're setting yourself up for disappointment. Don't put Him on a timetable. Trust Him. You know, if I tell my son that we're going to do something, and then you know we're going to we're going to go to Dairy Queen, and ten minutes later he's like, "Are we going to go to Dairy Queen or what?" I mean, as a father, that is not pleasing to me because I haven't told you we're going to Dairy Queen, right? Twenty minutes. Are we going to Dairy Queen? We're not even going to Dairy Queen. Now, what he's doing is, Amen. He is distrusting my goodness. 
because he does not believe my words. If I told you we're going to Dairy Queen, we're going to Dairy Queen. It may not be in a half hour. It may not be in 45 minutes. It may not be in three hours. But if I said it, we're going to do it. Can I get an amen? And how many know I am a man that can lie and God is not? So you serve a God that does not have the ability to lie. Because if God said the grass was orange, the grass would turn orange. Because whatever God says happens. So God, in these promises that He's made to you, He cannot lie to you. But He needs you to trust Him and rest in the fact that He loves you. And that He's going to take care of you. Can you get an amen? Now, interestingly enough, and we're closing right here, in verse 9, there remains there for a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered into his rest has, also, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Let us therefore labor to enter that rest. Now listen, <clears throat> there is a labor to enter the rest. But your labor is not doing what Jesus has already done. Are y'all tracking me? Did Jesus say it was finished? Was it finished? What's our part to believe? Our part is to guard our place of victory and believe and don't let the devil talk you down off the mountain. I'm talking about Mount Zion. Grace, the finished work. Don't let the devil talk you down off Mount Zion and go back to Mount Sinai. Because I'm here to tell you, on Mount Sinai, there ain't no angels. <laughs> Amen. And the enemy's always trying to... Now, what is the labor to enter into that rest? How many of you know there are times when you need to shut the TV off and hear the gospel? There are times when you uh, need to... Uh, sit the magazine down and pick the Bible up. Now listen, you reading the Bible, does that change what Jesus has done? It just allows you to believe it so you can enjoy it and rest in it. You're not reading the Bible to get healed. You're not reading the Bible to get protected. You're not reading the Bible to do any of these things. You are, you are, you are feeding on Jesus so that you can realize you already have these things. Are y'all tracking me here this morning? This is really important teaching. Because it is finished, is reality, and it's done, but for us to believe it and enjoy it and rest in it, you got to do things like what you're doing today. Today you came here and you heard the gospel. And you know what, happened, what has happened to you as you sit here? Because you have heard Jesus and you have fed on Jesus, peace has filled up inside of you. Rest has filled up inside of you. You have remembered that God loves you and God is for you and you are forgiven. So and what's happening is you are being reminded that you've already won and you are already seated in heavenly places. Now, as you walk out that door, there is a devil who's going to try to pull you out of victory again. And you are going to have to resist him in the faith and believe that God loves you and that it is finished. That is the fight of faith. Everybody understand? It's a fight of faith. You quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one with the shield of what? Faith. See, when, when your faith is small, the fiery darts get through and they start bringing doubt and fear and turmoil. Y'all tracking me here? See, you can enjoy the ride to heaven or you cannot. Either way, you're going. <laughs> We can party on, we can party through on this thing, or we can scrape by. But either way, we're we're we're, we're going. You know why? Because we're basically already there. Y'all tracking me here this morning? Amen. Did y'all get anything out of that? I'm gonna read this verse to you, and we're finished. First John five four. <laughs> it's the scripture that Brian called me with this morning. Brian basically called me this morning and preached my sermon to me on the phone. So, yeah, it was pretty cool. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Ladies and gentlemen, are you born of God? Yes. 
Have you already overcome the world? Yes. Already overcome the world. Amen? But realizing that you've overcome the world simply takes believing in what has already been done. Y'all tracking me? All right. We're done. Hallelujah. So, um, amen. Good news. Amen. Does anybody need prayer for anything?